Well, there was an error with Periscope. We're going to go live anyways. Hi, everyone, and welcome to SPED Homeschool Conversations. We are so happy to have you with us here tonight. Um, we are live on Facebook and YouTube, um, possibly Periscope. We'll see um, as time goes by, but um, having some issues with that to start out with. But we do this broadcast. Um, it's sponsored um, by a different... I guess one of our partners every week and this week um, Right Start Math is sponsoring this episode of Sped Home School Conversations and um, and so we we provide this um, these broadcasts for you parents who are homeschooling kids with special educational needs or thinking about it and um, looking for some resources on how do I do this and how do I do this well so um, this month in October we've been focusing on how do you do therapy at home and tonight we're going to talk about sensory diets and I have two Two special guests with me tonight to to share with us about that and the first is um, Jason Shea from Lackey Kids and the second is Matt Sloan from Sensory Fitness welcome gentlemen thank you for joining us thank you for having us thank you yeah. bud. glad to have you here so um so if you are joining us live we would love for you to to put in your questions, your comments as we're going along. And um, I'm gonna be asking these guys some questions and they're gonna be sharing a lot, but we definitely want to incorporate you in this conversation as well. So um, so let's, um, let's just kind of get started in getting to know both of you. And um, so Jason, Matt, whichever one of you wants to get started and um, let us know a little bit about yourselves and the businesses that you run that help families who have children with sensory needs. Sure, Matt, you go ahead, Matt. Sure, yeah, okay, I'll start. Thanks, Jason. My name is Matt, Matt Sloan. I uh, run a business called Sensory Fitness. Uh, I'm an occupational therapy assistant uh, and I specialize in sensory integration. Um, I started my business, Sensory Fitness, uh, in part, a piece of it, with why I decided to branch off on my own was when I was doing therapy in, with the kids and, at the clinic, um, mm -hmm. it was so much I wanted to be able to give to the parent to take home, but it was so hard to do that in like the few minutes you have in between sessions right. and, and <laughs> during, during a session, and I'm just like dropping bombs on on parents and they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> trying to understand sensory is it's pretty, to wrap your mind about it, if you're starting at kind of square one, it's kind of difficult. But mm. so one of the reasons I, you know, I do what I do is because I, I try to bring those practices into the home environment and educate parents. So part of, part of what I do is, uh, a big part of what I do is uh, I do sensory, I do fitness for kids with sensory struggles. That's, that's a big piece mm. of one on ones and small classes. Um, with another piece of what I do is I do education, and that's going to. Um, before this, I was a teacher. I was a special ed teacher for like 13 years. So oh, awesome. it, bringing the sensory thing back into the classroom was a big goal. Of mine. I was because uh, mm. as a teacher, I I would have found this stuff so useful. I didn't. I thought I got it, but I didn't really get it. Um, yeah. So that that was one of the driving forces behind again bringing the sensory world to. to to parents, to teachers, to other, to fitness instructors, to anybody who's working with kids. Um, so that's awesome. that's a big part of what what I do. And then I met Jason doing just that. And then we he's selling, uh, you know, he, he has the sensory equipment and lots of cool stuff. So and mm -hmm. he's got some great ideas. So we instantly hooked up. And now we're yep. It's a perfect match. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself, Jason. <laughs> Sure. Uh, my name is Jason Shea. Um, I'm a father and also an entrepreneur. And I usually call myself, um, I'm a proud father of an uh, autistic genius. And the main reason why I even started my business right now, Lucky Kids, is actually back in 2013 when uh, my son, uh, he's actually 10 uh, right now, back when he was three, when we first, me and my wife, heard about his diagnosis with autism. We were living back in Japan. So mm. as a country, like most of the Asian country, mental disability is a huge stigma. People don't like to yeah. talk about it. People don't discuss it, which lead to very lack of resources and opportunities. And to give you a perfect example, we used to live in Tokyo, one of the largest metropolitan area, have a single population as the city of New York. Mm -hmm. We can only find two therapy centers to take our son to. So wow. that is not a very good situation to mm -hmm. be 
when you have a kids with special needs and our sons are our first, so we don't really know what to do. So after a lot of debate, we decided to move to United States uh, back in 2015 because mm. we figured that's where we can give our son more opportunities and maybe to figure out how we can help him to with his life. So, yeah. um, so shortly after we moved to the United States back in 2015, we started to connect with a lot of other families that also have kids with special needs. Then we realized even in the United States, there's still not enough support, still right. not enough products, still not enough information. Hence the reason why me and my wife started this business back in 2017. We start creating some sensory product and sensory tool that the kids can use at a homeschool setting or at the classroom setting. Mm -hmm. And really starting out as trying to find a solution for our son and at the same time also help other families like ours that can be benefited from the product and from the different uh, resources that we are putting out. So I'm really passionate about this, mm -hmm. uh, my mission as not a parent, but also a special education advocate trying to advocate on um, okay. what are the things that parents that need to know. And that's, I would say special education, either you're homeschooling or you're going in the public school uh, system is a very sometimes overcomplicated <laughs> system. It's really hard to navigate. I mean, Mac, yeah. and I'll tell you all about it because even from a, te a special education teacher's perspective, it is complicated. But mm. from a parent's perspective with no formal trainings, on special education, you, you just feel lost when you first right. get into this kind of environment. So many, that's my yep. mission and my goal is to create product and offer information that can help families just like ours. Yeah, I know so many of our parents will relate to you. And I love that both of you have, saw a need and you were passionate enough to fill that need. And that's where your businesses um, run from. And um, I just... That, um, that really speaks a lot about, about who you are and um, why you do what you do. So I just appreciate that. And um, thank you for, for get, letting us get to know you a little bit as we're, we're kind of getting this conversation started. So, um, so and if you're just joining us, um, make sure that you, you join our conversation by making comments um, and putting them in the feed. Uh, so let's, as we're getting started, what specifically is a sensory diet? And... Um, how does that work? You know, what what is what does that do for a child? And um, and you kind of just take us through that and explain what what it is and and how it's helpful. Yeah, Matt, you can take that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> sure. So a sensory diet has the word diet in it, but it's mm -hmm. not, not have anything to do with the eating, although it could. But um, but in the sense of a diet, it's it's what your body needs throughout the day, just like a, a food diet, right? Being proactive is, I, I feel it's extremely crucial. So you can be proactive, uh, yes. food, right? Just mm -hmm. like before to eat food. If you're proactive about the food you get, generally you buy the healthier food. You know, mm -hmm. you're, like, you know you're in a donut, you need a couple donuts. Right. Yeah. Generally, generally you, you're, you're proactive about the food that you buy and that therefore you get the healthier food as opposed to you didn't prepare and you're reactive and you pass the, the Burger King and you get, you know, the, mm. the food you put in your body, that that junk food is still going to sustain you. It's still going to do the job, but it's not as functional. It's not as efficient. Same thing with sensory input. Mm -hmm. um, so getting getting your it, all that is all a sensory diet is is getting meeting your sensory needs throughout the day periodically. Um, and that's going to look different for everybody. It's going to look different on on it could be look different from day to day. Um, yeah. You know, to make to simplify it, you know, we can kind of break it into like seekers and avoiders. So. Seekers, mm -hmm. they're easy to talk about because it's they're kind of more obvious. But uh, kids that are seeking sensory input, um, my son, um, he's uh, I have two boys, one with uh, kind of unique sensory needs. He is he's a tactile guy. He mm. he seeks tactile input often, and so what I do to provide that sensory input to, to make part of his diet is getting that that input throughout the day. So we list, we start off the day before he has to sit down at a, at a computer for a virtual school. Which mm -hmm. is, for he's, he just turned uh, six. Um, he, I, we try to do a lot of jumping. We, we do a lot of jumping, crashing. Um, I let him have his feet off. His, his feet kind of rub on. Uh, I have a, 
a wacky kid um, with a cushion with a, with a spice <laughs> on the bottom, things like that that he can use before an activity that is going to require his attention. And if I can do something during that activity. So that's what a sensory guide uh -huh. is. It's providing sensory input, which is also movement. 95% of it is movement based. Um, mm -hmm. Before I'm going to ask a kid for his attention to focus on this thing, whatever that thing is, whether it's Got sitting it. at the right, sitting at a, a table to eat dinner, or getting a car ride, um, things that are going to require your kid's attention. And if they have, if they're avoiders, uh, kids that are high, hypersensitive, that mm. are really aware of, uh, typically that's like hot noises and, and high, highly visual, part of their sensory diet could look like getting some deep pressure before going to the supermarket. And mm. while they're maybe giving them some headphones or giving them a hat or a hoodie to reduce their vi vision, as well as afterwards, because afterwards those um, those kids that try to avoid those kinds of situations, they're going to be on edge. Their anxiety is going to be high. Right. So providing those sensory strategies that's particular to your kids, so they can just relax. And we all do it. We, mm. we all do sensory. We all have sensory diets. I that's get it. So true. Yeah. And I, we, I have coffee. That's part of my sensory diet. <laughs> my alert level up, right? Right. When I'm sitting in these, um, when, when I was a teacher, I had to sit through meetings or anybody who sits in meetings, you, you all do it. You all tap your foot. You all mm -hmm. put your head. You all, get, you all stand up. Those, that's, we're stretching. We're moving. We're, we're, we're getting our body to a, a, a regulated state so we can pay attention to this, whatever this is, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's also part of a sensory diet. We just have to be really intentional about it with some of our kiddos. And part of that is understanding sensory, then understanding the kiddo, and then understanding your kiddo's sensory needs. And that's, that goes with talking to your OT or filling out a sensory profile or some other mm -hmm. assessments and um, anyone who work, works with your kid. But, so that's my example, my explanation mm -hmm. of a sensory diet, if that makes sense. But yeah, it makes a, a whole lot of sense. And, you know, the, the fact that there's different things that are going to happen throughout the day, all of our days aren't the same. And so kind of having those components available and kind of building that diet around those activities or whatever is going to be happening, that um, that makes a lot of sense. And so, um, yeah. So, Jason, have you... Um, have you now? How are you schooling right now with with your son? Are you doing some virtual schooling at home, or is he actually going into school? Oh, oh I don't hear. We are in Washington State. Most of the school in Washington State is still remote, hundred percent remote. So we have three kids at home. So mm -hmm. my son, you know this. The other two is everyone's is remote learning pretty much. Yeah. So it's, it's also, uh, which make it really important to have some kind of sensory break in between because now right. you're 24 seven that's sitting in front of the computer. That could be very stressful situation for both the parents and the kid. Yeah, yeah. So you're taking full advantage of what you know and, <laughs> and putting that into effect in your home. So that's awesome. So um, as, as we talk about, you know, people that maybe weren't even homeschooling last year and had, you know, no plans for doing so. Um, what, from your perspective, are some advantages that parents have to take, that they they have it at the ready because of this situation that maybe their students didn't have when they were in a school setting that um, they can take advantage of or, or kind of see the, the light instead of the darkness in the tunnel? <laughs> I can share a little bit on that uh, from my yeah. personal experience. So, because uh, our son also have an IEP, and I think a lot of the listener that is on the call or watching the show also mm -hmm. might have an IEP. Right. Uh, if you switch to a hundred percent homeschool, I don't know if the IEP still is a requirement for that or not. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, you... it depends on your what your school district's providing. Um, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, for me, I learned this year is with my son's IEP is I know that we have all the accommodations, all the different modifications, but are those really sufficient in the mm. environment? That because of how much participation that me and my wife is putting into my son's school right now, we we, we tend to see a lot of problem at a, a, a much closer. 
Mm -hmm. We're sending the kids to the school because we don't really see it until the parents conference, until IEP, or occasionally when we talk to the teacher when the big problem raised up. But when we interact with uh, my son on a daily basis, we'll know like today is really like an off day where he couldn't get <laughs> anything correctly, where he couldn't focus at all. And we'll try to figure out what kind of additional accommodation or additional modification we can potentially do it for him at home. And mm -hmm. I think that kind of observation or that kind of understanding is kind of lacking in the previous year when we are not doing the remote learning where, where we were just not, I mean, I, I was working, but I, was, I wasn't working from home. I was still commuting to an office. So that makes it kind of hard because I don't really know what exactly is going on in my mm -hmm. son's school. But this, this year, it really gave me a, a brand new perspective on, of, of course, first of all, how hard it is to be a teacher. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is how to incorporate everything with everything that's going on. While I'm still working from home, my wife is also trying to help with homeschool, and we have two other kids running around, and uh, my younger daughter also have a homeschool, and trying to figure out all the puzzle pieces, and also mm -hmm. realize what other things that we as a parent may need to consider changing. I think that's really a, a really valuable lesson for both uh, me and my wife. Yeah, you can tweak and change things much quicker on the fly versus waiting until you kind of see everything blow up in the back end and then you try to decipher it from backwards, you know, from the the yeah. end result to what really caused this and what, you know, getting back to what um, what all that was. So, so, yeah, definitely that is a huge advantage um, that we see that parents see in, in being able to to be with their children in homeschool. And so um, for Matt, what, um, as far as, you know, you've been in the school, but also you have private therapy. Um, what what are some advantages that also with um, being able to work with a private therapist and um, and during all this this COVID situation, have, have you seen advantages in, in this as well as um, just, you know, some some things that you can tell parents that um, are are beneficial in in the midst of all these situations that they're yeah. in. No, yeah, these are these are pretty unique and crazy times. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're having kids sit in front of a laptop to talk to a teacher, or talk to a teacher that's not there, and you know, mm -hmm. wa watching my own my, my own two boys doing the teachers try to do classroom management through through virtual learning is it's tough. It's tough on the teacher. Yeah. It's tough. Every, they're kind of building the plan as they fly, and mm -hmm. it's tough. Um, you know, on the other side of that, it's what I. It's kind of worked out for my my youngest guy because in kindergarten he had a rough time because he he mm. just mover he needs to move 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 right. so he had a lot of you know phone calls and emails and stuff like that. <laughs> but at home he's able to get the movement he needs. Uh, mm. Right, I'm in. I have a. I'm lucky. I have a. I have a sensory gym in my face. That's where I am right now. And I had the kids do school back then. So the benefit, the, the advantage that I see, and I, I think all parents can take advantage of it, whether they have a sensory gym or not, they mm -hmm. incorporating movement as, as much as they can. Sitting down at a desk, doesn't learning doesn't have to happen at the desk. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to happen. You, you know, on some level it does because um, the only dipstick a teacher has to tell is if you're the only metric a teacher has that if your kid is paying attention is this head that's right here. And right. if I'm over here, <laughs> teacher thinks I'm not paying attention. So right. that's the only metric they have. But kids don't need to be in a seat. I'm in a rocking chair right now. Like, like that's okay. There's a thousand mm -hmm. things you can do to incorporate movement to help your kid pay attention, like to stuff like that. But right. besides that, but um, kids can get more movement at home. It just you know they can do chores. There's more interaction. It can be tough for parents to manage that. I can, I, mm -hmm. We're all living it. It's hard. You know, I'm, I'm also working from home. I'm trying to be here for my kids while they do school. And then now I have to go manage their movement breaks. That's, that's <laughs> right. But also we're just presenting options. Or they can just kick them outside and, you know, if, they, if you have a yard or swing, yeah. take advantage of those things. Um, yeah. Things like that, allowing a lot more movement um, in that sense. Because at school, there's playground, there's playground time, there's PE, but it's not, there's a lot of desk time, which can, like, can not always yeah. work in kids' favors because they have to, they're sitting and they might be white knuckling for the day. 
Mm-hmm. It's all smaller pieces. Where now it's like that's one thing that I'm seeing for my son is that he's not what Yeah. He does some movement, then he gets 30 minutes in front of the laptop, then he gets some movement, then he has to do some work, then he gets some movement. So he's getting a ton mm-hmm. of movement that his body needs in order for him to do that tiny bit of work. My oldest son is right. hard for a longer bit of time, but he can, you know, it's the same thing, right? I, Mm-hmm. So you know that's the advantage is is, is allowing a lot more movement, trying you know doing things like chores, using, and it's also an opportunity to learn other skills like dishwashing, building the dishwasher, laundry, that kind of stuff. That, those are the incredible skills we all need. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. You're you're building in other things that as parents we always want to teach, but we run out of time because school yeah. takes up such a large chunk of the day. Yeah for our students and here now we can say, oh, well, you need some movement? Well, let's work on this life skill. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, I think one thing to remember is like the time your kid needs to learn is the, the uh, direct instruction time is not really that long. It's you know, mm. not how much it's one-on-one or direct instruction your kid gets during the school day. Maybe it's 30 minutes, right. maybe, it's, maybe it's an hour. I don't out of the whole day of school. Um, my wife should know that she's a principal. She knows all this, all the stats. <laughs> I don't remember the stats. I just know it's so. If you think about it, if you get thirty minutes of solid minute uh, time. You know, it, depending on the age, right? If you get thirty mm-hmm. minutes or an hour of, or whatever, of that instruction time, and then the rest of the time is not as organized, and that's okay. That's as much. Yeah. They're learning that that direct instruction because that's the that's the peak learning. Time. There's a lot of passive mm-hmm. ways to learn, but that that's the teaching bit, right? Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> not stressing out about. I gotta get my chick, my short kid sitting in front of the computer or blah blah blah. You know, if you can maybe maybe you have a, a teaching opportunity that you see during the day, take that. If the kid mm-hmm. can get the screen time in front of the then you know, kind of balance that out that if I'm explaining that. Yeah, well and and a lot of parents who do parent directed home education versus the school at your home, mm-hmm. um, a lot of them will say, Well, I only teach my child for when they're younger about a half an hour total. Um, to in high school, maybe two, two and a half hours, because that's all the direct instruction that student needs. It doesn't mean that they aren't learning all the time. It's just that that's that one-on-one back on back and forth. Um, they're learning. I mean, my daughter just picked up a new instrument today and is already playing like three new songs. <laughs> so, and that, you know, that's, there's a ton of, that's math. That's you know, Exactly. If you're moving, if your kid's outside playing with a stick and, and climbing trees, he or she is learning. There, mm-hmm. that's the building blocks to build on for all those other higher cognitive skills. So, like allowing your kid to move and play and get muddy and and do all, those are sensory weight. Those are sensory strategies. Those are we can call them whatever we want. They're moving. They're, right. they're learning and they are interacting with the, with the natural world, and those are all very important building blocks that mm-hmm. a lot of times they miss out on because they're on the bus ride, they're in school, they're you know, we were we're cramming them to soccer practice, and then it's time for whatever. All these other things we pile on top of our kids. Well, mm-hmm. you know, it's us to the side. <clears throat> so allowing this time to just have some free time and stare at a tree for a half an hour is, it, it's incredible. Mm. What that, you know, just for the nervous system. I wonder how many kids will come back a little different when school starts up again, right? For better or for hopefully for better. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think yeah, even a lot of parents are realizing that there's, there's like Jason was talking about, you know, just the, the, the dynamics you're seeing within your, your children. And, um, and I'm sure you're seeing some dynamics even between your children. And as, as homeschoolers, I know that's that that was like, the biggest fear of mine was my boys, just like ward all the time. And <laughs> it was, Let's let's just learn some character training and how we dad beat each other up. <laughs> I, I feel like, yeah, it's constant at my house. Too, yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, mine are now twenty one and twenty three, and they're each other's best friends. So uh, I'll give you some better. encouragement on that end. <laughs> it's encouraging. But but yeah, it um, and we don't often relate a lot of what what you're talking about is you know those 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 simple elemental play things as being sensory input that we need in order to be able to focus on um, those really tough mental tasks that we do in front of computers or in front of books and those types of things and um, it can be very difficult especially for young children 
So no matter if they are on a spectrum or have any diagnosed sensory need at all, I think, like you said before, Jason, or not Jason, but Matt, that we we all do it, you know, whether it's our cup of coffee or, or whatever. So um, that's so, so true. So, um, yeah. Um, so... I'm debating whether we should dive in or if we should hear from our sponsor and then go into the next questions. I think what I'm going to do is we're going to take a quick break. We're going to hear from our sponsor. I'm going to let Jason and Matt take a, a quick break off the camera. And then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about specifics, about sensory seeking children and sensory avoiding children and what um, activities and products and, and different things that um, you as a parent can, can look at as possibilities for being able to build into a sensory diet. So, um, so we'll be right back with that and I'll give you two some time off the camera and I'll bring you back in just a minute. <laughs> All right. Well, we want to thank, um, Right Start Math for sponsoring this episode of Sped Homeschool Conversations. I'm going to bring up their website right there, rightstartmath.com. And Right Start Math will help your child understand, apply, and enjoy mathematics using games to learn concepts, strategies, and to practice math facts. This unique program uses visualization of quantities, de-emphasizes counting, and provides strategies like visual pictures for learning the facts. Place value is introduced early to solidify the children's understanding um, of that that basic math skill. And the primary tool is an AL abacus. It's specifically designed two-sided abacus that's kinesthetic and visual. Do your children like to play games? Well, we have those too. We have, Right Start Math has over 300 math card games that the children will love. They want to help your child achieve success by getting rid of the frustration and the tears while having fun. So definitely check out our sponsor. Um, Right Start Math at uh, rightstartmath.com. And um, if you're struggling trying to figure out is this a, a good math pro um, program or I don't know what we're using for math or we want to switch to parent-led instruction and um, we, we need a math program. So um, definitely check them out. Um, they're one of our partners here on at spedhomeschool.com. So um, I'm going to bring my guest back and we're going to continue talking a, about sensory diets and just um, how to actually go about creating a sensory diet. So welcome back, gentlemen, and um, just thank you for all the information you've shared already in the first half of our hour. And um, just, you know, we were talking about basics of um, sensory diets and why we need them, and um, I, I think, uh, hopefully, <laughs> We, we've all got that understanding, and I just want our audience to know, if you have specific questions, if you have a child, say, that my child's doing this, what what are they seeking, or what are they trying to avoid, or, you know, how do I figure that out? Um, definitely put those in the comments, and we will, we'd love to discuss those as well. But, um, like you had said, I think, at one point, Matt, that the sensory seeking child is probably the easier one. <laughs> well, I mean I don't know about easier, but yeah, maybe easier to identify. Right. right. <laughs> yes. Maybe not easier to live with. <laughs> yeah. I, have, I have both ends of, the, of that spectrum. I have the, the avoider and I have the speaker, uh, seeker. Uh huh. <clears throat> I, I think they come in pairs. I, I think yeah. I do too. <laughs> it's very siblings to be very opposite when it comes to sensory difficult. It's, it, I don't know why that is. It's just something. Yeah. Else. Huh. So. So a typical sensory seeking child, what, how would you describe them or their behavior or what, what would they do that would show that they're seeking sensory input? Yeah. So, okay. So they're seeking, they're looking for input to make them feel better. Right. Um, when I get up, I, I try to make it an analogy anytime I can, but when I get up in the morning, I'm seeking that coffee because that's going to bring me to a, a, a regulated state. It's going to make mm -hmm. my brain organized. It helps me. Okay, now I can deal with whatever's around. Your kiddo who's ping-ponging off the walls is looking for that input. And mm. to be specific, you know, it's usually, it's not always the case, but it's usually vestibular input, which is the movement of my head, specifically my head, huh. with balance. That's my vestibular input. Uh, my vestibular sense is located in my uh, vestibular cochlear bone. It's in my inner ear, right? 
it has to do with balance. And mm-hmm. you know, if you cl- if you just shake your head up and down, you're you're, you're activating a vestibular system. Mm-hmm. They may be moving to get that input. Um, ah. or, and a lot of times, vestibular kids, you know, um, when I activate the vestibular system, I generally bring that alert level up. So mm-hmm. they might be seeking it for a lot of reasons. Where they, they don't feel it, or they're just trying to get some sense of where their body is in space. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a reason they're doing that. So vestibular kids look like you know they, maybe they're doing handstands, or they're they're the kids that are spinning in their chair, or they're, <laughs> oh, they all get up to swing, mm-hmm. things like that. Or if they get sick in the car. It kind of goes the opposite way. They could still be ah. sickles and avoiders at the same mm-hmm. at the same time, or one the other day. But there's something off. It's just something off about their vestibular. Uh, then there's the, the the proprioception, that's internal, like awareness. So when I pick something up, I feel it in my muscles, and that's letting me know where my body is, mm. kind of, like inside out, right? Um, my proprioception seekers, they're the kids that you know, they'll they'll when you go to the grocery store, you want those kids because they were they're, they're going to carry the milk jugs, okay. <laughs> they like the yeah, milk, or they're going to hang from the monkey bars because they like that mm-hmm. track. Um, so they're they're feeling the pull and push of the muscles. Maybe they they climb a lot because they're feeling it. They're using their body a lot. Right. And tactile can look similar. Tactile is outside in. It's light touch and deep pressure. Mm-hmm. They're the kids that you know are constantly touching everything or they're hitting everything. Because mm-hmm. when I run into something, that's that's tactile. I'm feeling it on the outside in. Got and our in our bashers. My youngest son, I thought he was a I say pro. I thought he was a proprioception kid for a long time. And then one day I was at the beach and he was, um, he was just in the sand and he was totally relaxed. And I was, I'm hmm. like, I've never seen that before. <laughs> oh, of course, I you can't diagnose your own kid; it's impossible. But <laughs> You're right. I took it forever to figure that out. So you know the way I did things, I and I do things differently now. But knowing that helps. So. Um, what was your right. So, so like having a sensory bin for a child that needs to have the movement and to have their head moving around, that's not going to work because you have a child that's seeking sensory input in a different area. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, looking at those three senses right there. Mm-hmm. Working, if, you have a, if your kid goes to OT, they're the ones that are going to be able to help you with figure out what kind of sensory seeker your kid is. There's a couple of assessments they can do. Uh, oh, not awesome. all OTs are trained in sensory integration therapy, but mm-hmm. most OTs understand the sensory piece of it. And, that, and that's cool. That's mm-hmm. fine. And you, there's a lot of resources you can pull from to, to, to get more into the sensory piece. Um, but, you know, kind of kind of knowing that really, really helps. Right. right. Definitely. If a kid needs a sensory break, let's bust out the water beads. Well, right. my, you know, my vestibular seeker is not going to really care about that. or maybe mm-hmm. they're going to, you know, and it's, it's also important to understand that, you know, light touch and vestibular is a kind of an alerting sense. So mm. if I'm doing these things, I'm doing these kinds of activities, or I'm seeking that, and then I, and I, or I let them go in the swing, or I let them play in the sand, and then I say, okay, let's sit down and do some work. Their alert level's way up here. So yeah. understanding that, okay, well, let's end with some heavy work. Because that's proprioception is always a good go-to. Heck, moving, doing some. I don't know if you've heard the term heavy work. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. I move heavy things, and I push and I pull, and I, even if I'm blowing bubbles or sucking through a straw, that's really hard work, and that helps me kind of get organized. There's mm-hmm. a reason why we feel better after we go to the gym. It's right. not you got our blood pumping. It's we, our brain is like, ah, okay, great. Mm-hmm. All these chemicals are released, and it feels good. Right. So just knowing the difference really helps in those specific three um, to keep it simple, I guess. Yeah. yeah. One thing I want to add to that is, is sometimes you just really don't know until you try. Like for us, we have a small like sensory corner in our house that have different like sensory items, like fidget toys or like weighted blanket. That's mm-hmm. you just don't know until you try it. Like weighted blanket for my son doesn't really work as well as other mm-hmm. kids, but I know for some kids that. Uh, because we also sell weighted blankets. It's, for some kids, it works a miracle, but for my mm. son, it work as well. So it's, it all depends on the kids. So. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. That is a really good point. Yeah, just trying things out and seeing how they go. And yeah, um, That's a great point, Jason. Yeah, don't be afraid to try something. 
it, it might blow up in your face. And it's, I hate saying this, but it's kind of true. What, what works one day might not work the next day, but that doesn't mean uh-huh. you the back side, right? Mm-hmm. Try it, see it works. Okay, you know that's going to work again. Put that in your tool belt. If you mm-hmm. see consistently it doesn't work, then maybe chuck it out. But keep that in your tool belt. Keep that as like, you know, part of your arsenal of tools for your car. Uh-huh. And, you know, sometimes you need this tool, sometimes you need this tool, but eventually you need this tool. At some point. Yeah, and I think that's also a reason why the concept of uh, flexible seating is so popular in the public school system. And that's something we can also implement in a home school or remote learning environment. Just instead of using a chair, you can use a yoga ball. Instead of mm. you can be standing, instead of always being in the room, you can be doing the Zoom outside or some other places instead of the, always the same location. Sometimes that, I mean, at least for, for our kids, that really helps. So. Yeah, the, the active seating is, is, yeah, it's, it's just what Jason says, it's active, active seating or dynamic seating. Or, mm. um, and it's movement based. Uh, you know, things yeah. like, uh, like, uh, like Jason's company has like yoga balls and, mm-hmm. uh, and wiggle cushions. They're moving. They're getting that movement. That's active seating. It's it's all movement based. Mm. So, you know, uh, I had a point I was going to make and I lost my thought. <laughs> well, I was going to also say, too, it's got to be you, you don't want to just stick to one thing because it seems like these kids, you know, they want to be up. They want to be down. They want to be kind of all, all over the place. And so to, to not say, oh, well, this is your thing. And this is, you know, how you think best. Um, it seems like just giving them options of variety may even be more helpful. And that's a piece of it too. Generally, a kid is going to, generally, the seekers are going to seek things that are they're doing that for a reason. So they're doing it because it organizes. So we want to give it to them in a functional way. If my kid's going to move. My kid's going to move. If, and if I try to clamp that down, I put my mm. kid in fight or flight. And then yeah. whatever it is that I'm doing, they're not really going to learn as well. It might be a little bit, but it's it's like you or me. Yeah. We're, we're putting. Yeah. Do we learn under stress? I don't yeah. learn under stress. Mm-hmm. I, I learn when I'm when I'm comfortable. It's like you have to go to the bathroom. You're not learning anything. You have to take care of that sensory need. <laughs> the kids that are ping ponging in and out of their seats, or mm-hmm. or they're hypersensitive or whatever. That that that's a base need. It's a, it's a it's a physiological need. That need mm. has to be met. There. Generally, kids want to please. They want to do what you're asking them to do. Yeah. If they're yeah. not, it's generally a pant. Mm-hmm. Not, not so much a woman. It's kind of a mind, uh, kind of a way to look at it. Like, would you ask a kid in a wheelchair to walk up the steps? Right. No, because maybe they can't. So, our kiddos, some of our kiddos, they can't sit for a long time. Or there's some things they can't do because of that sensory need is met. So, mm-hmm. when you start thinking that way, it does help you have a little bit more patience. Because sometimes I look at my kiddo like. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? And then I got to remember, okay, you can do it. I, you know, I have to say it out loud to myself. Okay, you, can't, uh-huh. you, can't do it, you can't do it. I got to help them. And then I, you know, because we're all parents and we have this much patience. Right, right now. exactly. Anyway, with COVID, we have this much patience. But. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> specific activities um, other than, you know, just the, the yoga balls and other things, of, you know, as far as like, you know, getting outside or things that they, you ha- can have in your home, that would be really helpful for a child who is a, a sensory seeking to, to build into their diet. Where do you want me to start? Um, <laughs> specific activities? Yeah. So, um, you know, for the seekers, I, you, when you're going to, it helps to identify what they're seeking. Right. So that's that you can just sit back and watch what he's doing. Okay, is he crashing into the wall? Okay, maybe that's kind of tap. Is he <laughs> squishing him getting does he like to crawl in, in the small spaces? Are they <clears throat> are they doing handstands or rolling around, rolling around? That could be the mm-hmm. Um so experimenting with kind of those three things. Movement of the head, you know, you can you can do things like when you do movement breaks to get them to do somersaults and rolly rollies and stuff, oh like yeah, mm-hmm. and jump, jumping up and down on the furniture, that kind of thing, because you're you're get you're kind of getting everything, right? If I'm crawling, over, if I'm doing an obstacle course, well, obstacle courses in living rooms are fantastic. Oh yes, I remember those days. <laughs> rolling, you're moving, you're getting the tactile input, you're getting the you're getting the, the depressure, you're squeezing under pillows, maybe. Mm. So that's a good way to do it. If you have swings, utilize those. Mm-hmm. Um, Linear swinging is always a good, nice and rhythmic and calming, and that's really good. When the spinners, 
that's maybe one thing you want to keep an eye on because spinning, if I'm just spinning for a good amount of time and I stop and then I go do something, four hours later I could be melting. It's just hmm. spinning in particular. So if you're gonna, if your kid's spinning, try to get them to 10, then 10 the other way, do and then stop and then do some heavy work, that kind of thing. So whatever it is you do, it's always kind of, always kind of a good rule to kind of end with some sort of heavy work. Hmm. Heavy work can look like stacking things. I like to use oral motor because that's a good way to fun. And if you're you're strengthening all sorts, you're doing all sorts of incredible things when you do oral motor. Oral motor is movement of the mouth, right? So think of like if I have a straw and I'm blowing bubbles into um, hmm. a soapy dish of water and I'm, I'm making bubbles come up that has resistance. That's oh. cool. Resistance is always good. Things like uh, the lack of kid. I should have had some stuff, Jason. I didn't bring it. <laughs> but the re- they, Jason sells some of these resistance bands that you can just pull and you can put them around the seat for your kids to kick. Or you can pull them. Mm. I put. I my son likes to wear his on his forehead because he gets a squeeze. Oh. Then, you know, it's, uh-huh. it's tactile, right? Because it's outside right. and squeezing. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of, it's not the same as weight. It's different. That's just kind of fresher, but it, like Jason was talking about the. Uh, the the weighted blankets. Some kids like that. Some kids don't. If they don't mm-hmm. like the weighted blankets, you can try some fresh. Oh, there you go. I like those because they're really small. You know, they 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 can, they're made right because you're only the ones you buy at the store. They're like two, three times the size for the, yeah. the stretching bands. Yeah. Yeah, they're gonna, mm-hmm. they're gonna crawl the way across the room and snap. Right, exactly. <laughs> I can make yeah. trebuchets out of them or something. Yeah. <laughs> Things like that. Wow. But yeah, so I, I kind of try to stick to those kind of, um, you know, there's so many activities you can do within those senses. I mean, it's almost endless. Right. Um, yeah. Things like that. Well, those are awesome ideas. Yeah, I love that. And um, Jason, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, we, I mean, we haven't been doing this for a while, but in the summer, doing some, we used to have like a daily like almost like a PE lesson in our house where in, we just have kids to do like jump roll or different activity in the backyard. And that, that usually helps just have them go outside yeah. and do some basic activities. Like uh, we're doing like jump roll thing. We're also doing like different games, like um, mm-hmm. like tags and different, this is different, very simple games. But that, that usually just help the kids because otherwise they stay in the homes whole day mm. that can drive you crazy so. right yeah especially for those kids that just want to stay on the computer or play a game and you know just to get them outside and to motivate them with an activity i love that idea and jason brings up a good point um two, I, two points right there is uh you know he's talking about jumping rope and doing things like that like that's not necessarily you're getting some sensory input but that's also when you do things like coordinating activities like oh jumping, yeah Throwing a ball at a target or catching a ball and keeping it rhythmic, that's a coordinating activity. Things like that, those, that's a, those are very regulating things. And hmm. you know, all these other motor skills which are needed for, again, kind of that higher, those higher cognitive things. We right. ask them to hand right, um, mm-hmm. and they kick a ball. I mean, if they can't kick a ball or throw a ball, I might, and they're having trouble and they hate handwriting, I might go, go let's work, things like that. Working right. Like kicking a ball at a target. Not mm-hmm. just playing, but at a target, or in, if they can't, then make the ball bigger. You know, rugby ball or a beach ball. Oh, really yeah. Big, really basic, and these are coordinating activities. And then I'm, I'm working on attention, because I, you know, that's attention. Mm-hmm. If I, and if it's motivating, the kid likes it. Hey, that's even that's 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 exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> if, if I'm learning to play, I'm doing ten times the amount of learning than if someone's forcing me to learn. If mm-hmm. we're going to play and we're having fun with this activity, and like Jason's talking about, if they're having, you, you're doing way more than giving your kid a worksheet and a pencil and saying, mm-hmm. "Learn how to hand work on our handwriting." But if, if they're, you know, if they're if they're laying all these foundational skills like shoulder strengthening through catching and throwing the ball, and right. our core and joint stability and crossing all these crossing midline, these are things that have to be there before we get into the fine motor piece for tension piece or eye-hand coordination piece. There's so mm-hmm. much that is below, it's the iceberg below the water that things like that Jason was talking about. Yeah. And having fun with your families is, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. I, I picked that over forcing my kid to do 
to do the work. That came out wrong. Of course, I'm going to have my <laughs> accountable, right? I'm going to I'm going to hold my kid accountable and have him do the work. But I'm also going to use these sensory strategies as opposed to behavior strategies, which is more yeah. of a top down process. Because I might I'm going to get more out of it. Yeah, and but there's there's so much evidence. I, I remember interviewing a, an expert on um, reading, and she was talking about how long ago, you know, and I think it's long ago, 70s, 60s, but they would not even teach a child how to, to start reading until they could do a bilateral movement on the monkey bars because oh. there's something related to that within our brain and it's just pointless. So so there's there, there's so much that goes along with what you guys have been talking about. I mean, your eyes have muscles. Those muscles need to be developed. It's not like it just you just suddenly can... Reading takes... Using my mm-hmm. eyes, all those muscles need to coordinate. I need binocular vision. I need depth perception. I need tracking. Saccades. Yeah. I need um, all, all sorts of visual things that are built from monkey bars, or grabbing a stick and hit or, and hit the tree, or throwing <laughs> rocks at, at the water. Things like that. Yeah. Those are huge foundational blocks that need to be built. Yeah. So yeah. our kids are asking for it. <laughs> and we need to give it to them. <laughs> you can be creative with some of the like the point system you can set up. Like uh, I remember during summer, I was setting up like a reward system where my kids ah. can earn different points each day by doing chores or doing mm-hmm. different activities, and in, in return they'll get some iPad break. But it's just sometimes you can even play around with that and see what works for your families, and uh, and uh, they find it kind of motivating at the same time. So. They can actually help around and wash some dishes or clean clean up their room, for example, to get to the point and kind of tie that back to, to the school potentially to so the kids can feel a little bit more motivated throughout the day. So. Right. Yeah. For those that aren't aren't as active, and so I guess that it kind of transitions us more to those sensory avoidant children. <laughs> and um, what what do we do with them, and how do we help them? To, to get their needs as well. I, I think they tend to be a little less um, blatant and out there, but but yet we, we still see their their behavior that that says I, I need some some help with a, a sensory diet as well, don't they? Yeah. So the avoiders, you know, they are hypersensitive. They they have their feelers way out, and they generally sense things and feel things more so than than other people do so mm. you know i it's not always the case but it's easy to explain it this way so reducing visual and reducing auditory can help because that's generally um you just kind of look at your kid what do, what do they avoid are they don't do they not like moving i mean maybe that's their vestibular system and they don't like it mm. and, mm-hmm. and so just knowing that you know okay i'm not going to force them to go and on a four-hour car ride, or maybe I'll do some strategies to help them before he gets in the car, or another mm-hmm. roller coaster. Um, but my avoiders, I, I, I mean, it, it's so hard to give like a general right. uh, tip, but you know, having places for them to kind of reduce input. So you know, having a small dark place for them to kind of go and hide with some, again, go to uh, proprioception is always a good thing, like the heavy work or deep pressure is also very common. Mm. So that can, having like a weighted blanket can help me deal with the noise better. Okay. Um, reducing the visual can help me deal with that, with the tag on my shirt. Maybe. <laughs> um, there's a lot of, you know, reducing the, as, as the kind of the visual and the auditory can help a lot and as a, with compression and, and that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes the kids that get labeled um, avoiders are kind of a lower, energy kids and that's not always the case mm. the energy kids can still be seekers they're just seeking to, you know um, maybe <clears throat> they're seeking in a different way mm. but to to help it's all about regulation we want the thermostat to be kind of in a nice right. spot yeah okay you know, way over here way too hot way too cold or kind of zip zap in between so um you know keep in mind like if i if i use if I'm doing tact, something light touch tactile stuff, or I get my kid on a swing, that's always going to increase my alert level. Mm-hmm. Um, that might be something you can try with kind of uh, a hypersensitive or, or excuse me, our lower alert level kids. 
um, as, as a, and the proprioception and the deep pressure can you know, bring that alert with the fin. Okay. Getting off topic, but yeah, but that also one thing that I want to mention uh, once hopefully the COVID situation is settled down, that people can really go out again and go to visit a lot of the public, uh, mm -hmm. like for example, as arenas and stadiums. That's a wonderful program uh, hosted by a different nonprofit organization called Culture City. They have a program. Yes, I remember you talking about them. Uh, sensory Inclusive Initiative, which you can go and get a free sensory product when you for your families visiting like NBA stadium, zoos, aquariums. And uh, that is an uh, organization that uh, my company actually partnered with and we design product for their program. And it's all, most of the, the, the locations are free. And as part of the program, they not only provide sensory bags and they also provide uh, educations for the staff, for the outside staff. That's so the staff important. Have the sensory mm -hmm. And they also help those um, zoos or NBA stadiums to build sensory rooms so the family can actually go to a quiet space in the case of sensory overload or some like overstimulation like Matt was just mentioning, those mm -hmm. alternative. But at the same time, you can also try to recreate that kind of sensory room in your own house or recreate a sensory corner. So in case when you notice your kids is a little bit overstimulated, you can mm -hmm. take them to that space that room or that corner so you can have they can have a transition so that that's another thing that we a lot of the parents should, should definitely give it a try yeah so you know like i'm, I'm thinking you know our, on our homeschooling days and kids being overloaded with the input from video screens and you know online classrooms and those are the types of kids with these these kids that are on sensory overload, they're going to need that quiet space that they can retreat to, to to just decompress throughout the day too, and to build that into their schedules. And is that kind of the the idea of? Yes, yeah, and we actually designed a very specific product. Uh, it's a rideable weighted blanket. We are actually out of stock, so I don't have one to show, but uh, hopefully we'll have more soon. But yeah. that specific product, actually, I got an idea from Matt. I was talking to him two years ago about this idea. How can we make weighted blanket more fun to use? And mm -hmm. one who brought up the idea, how about we make it like the kids can write on it? So uh, okay. I spent like nine months designing and coming up with idea and talking with manufacturers. But now we actually have a physical usable product that kids can write on the weighted blanket itself using a mm. water pen and it's not interactive. And that was also the product we are um, providing to Culture Cities program for them to use in the NBA stadiums, in the zoos, and in the aquarium, etc. So. Awesome. So um, as we're wrapping up, where we've got less than 10 minutes, I want each of you to talk about your businesses and how people can find you. So so Jason, just since you were just talking, um, lackeykid.com. Um, and and what, what types of products and um, things do you have on your website that people can dive into that you offer? Yeah, we do uh, design whole, all kind of different sensory products, mostly for homeschooling or for uh, classrooms, including flexible seating product, which I kind of mentioned a little bit. And we have some uh, fine motor product, like those, uh, those tech, uh, the kids with tactile seeking, that we have some um, fidgeting, uh, fidget toys that uh, the kids can or the parents can try and we also have a few different weighted product that is currently mm -hmm. in our product line uh, that including a weighted neck pillow weighted blankets or different small we don't have a full size weighted blanket but we, most of ours is smaller that's portable and it's good for like that's in important cooling environment mm -hmm. so, and we also have a special offer right now if you go to lackykit.com forward slash offer you can actually get a free uh, one of our fidget toys for free. All you need to do is just pay for shipping and handling. It's one of our fidget marble maze um, that um, a lot of the, we got pretty good feedback for a lot of the family that have been using it, especially for homeschooling and doing that transition time. We are offering uh, all, the, all the family that's interested that they can give it a try of a toy for free. Just need to pay for the shipping. Awesome. Well, thank you for doing that. Yeah, that's that's great. And um, yeah, and Lackey Kid is a, a partner for with Sped Homeschool. We've um, 
got got to know Jason quite a while ago. So I'm I'm excited to have you you on and sharing your information with us. And um, and then Matt, how can people find you at Sensory Fitness? Yeah, you can go to my website sensoryfitness.org. It's under construction, so I apologize. So <laughs> the best way to, to kind of you can look at what I have to offer there, and then you can best way to kind of get in contact with either a messenger or Facebook or email. Um, but, you know, what I was doing before COVID was kind of one-on-one -on -one classes and small group classes in person. Mm -hmm. um, we're going more the virtual route now. So Jason and I are offering a, uh, a fitness class, virtual fitness class for kids, five through, awesome. five through nine. I can't remember. Five through, what is it, five through 12? Yeah. Uh, so we've got, I've got that going on and, you know, I, it's it's uh, a lot of uh, sensory motor movements and uh, mm -hmm. things we've all been talking about. Um, also, I do lots of trainings for parents and for teachers and for fitness professionals. I've got a whole bunch of workshops I'm constantly doing for things you can do in the classroom, things you can do at home for parents. Um, and then sensory motor, I kind of bring in what I would do in sensory integration therapy into the fitness world. Any fitness professionals interested in, in helping kids with you know, being very intentional oh, be awesome. about mm -hmm. the activities you do, as opposed to just general fitness. I try to bring the intentional activities into the fitness world and PE specifically. I do a training for them as well. Um, my God, oh. so, oh, that's kind of it for now. But <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> our trainings and and uh, virtual classes to, to help with doing Great. doing what we can to help bring uh, some of this understanding to homes um, and teachers and other environments so people can kind of understand where their kiddos are coming from and maybe why why are they doing it? Why, why is my kid doing it? right exactly why do they have to read upside down every day i mean that's, that's the question i get and i was like well maybe they just need to read upside down <laughs> why are they screaming the lungs every five minutes yeah. that's the reason for that Oh, exactly. Well, this has been a very educational and informative hour. I, I thank both of you gentlemen for your time. This has been um, so enlightening. And um, I thank our our um, community that's been watching live. Um, didn't get any questions, but hopefully we these guys answered your questions and more. Um, I know they've, I definitely have learned a lot in the last hour. Um, I just want to thank both of you for um, taking time out of your schedules to, to share with us and um, just for your hearts to help these um, to help families who have kids that are just looking for these sensory inputs and um, and all that you do to help them. So thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you very much for having us. Thank yeah, you. awesome. Yep. And um, we're not done yet with this month of October. So we have one more week left of f focusing on therapy at home. And next week we're going to talk about home strategies for language and literacy with a speech and language um, therapist that is also one of our partners. Um, she's with Discovery Speech, Language, and Literacy. And so we are going to talk about that next week on just some things that you can do at home to, to help with those um, speech and language um, therapy goals that you have for your student and how you can build on that in, outside of therapy. So um, we'll talk about that next week. But we also want to thank um, Right Start Math for sponsoring this episode of Sped Home School Conversations. And um, and also for just viewers like you, um, we are a nonprofit, and so we we thank you for your support and um, just l let us know how we're doing and um, how we can continue to to help you to empower you to teach special education home. So thanks everybody again. Thank you to my guests um, Matt and Jason, and um, have a great night. And we'll see you all next week. Bye everybody. Bye everybody. Bye.